This is the Dreadful Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're here talking about Lovecraft Country Season 1, Episode 9, Rewind, 1921. Pig Leg Taylor's last stand on Standpipe Hill. Oh, that was something. Still, they burned down Briar's Taylor shop. Dr. Jackson, best Negro surgeon in all America. Shot in the face. Miss Rogers lost her invalid daughter. White Phelps took her Negroes, hit him in the basement. Door knocks. They did him in the worst. And Thomas? Welcome back, fellow Dreadfuls, to episode 9 of the first season of Lovecraft Country, Rewind 1921. We head back to the world of 1921 and the Tulsa Massacre. Uh, I am one of your hosts, John. I'm your other host, Derek. Yeah, welcome back. The penultimate episode of season 1 of Lovecraft Country. It certainly is. Gosh, it's flown by. Uh, What a great great series this has been Mm -hmm. uh, so far and this episode at least from my point of view really just kept up the sheer quality uh, of this uh, show so far definitely yeah yeah really really interesting i know if you haven't listened to all of our podcasts you may not know but we did cover watchmen last year on hbo uh, and that also had a, had scenes based around the Tulsa uh, massacre in 1921. Um, we talked about it back then. We learned a lot of the history about uh, what actually happened during that period of time in, in uh, over those three nights during 1921. Um, and revisiting it this time in Lovecraft Country was so interesting, seeing a, a bigger take, I suppose, than what we saw on Watchmen. I know that was kind of our first introduction to the Tulsa massacre, this absolutely horrible time in American history. Uh, but absolutely needs to be revisited often so you know all about it. It's a fascinating period, a really terrifying period for uh, for black Americans and for all Americans, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, it's such a, an eye-opener. Mm-hmm. Certainly that opening of Watchmen and then seeing it here again where it's kind of more in the thick of it, yeah. I felt. Yeah. Um, you really get a sense of people having to deal with this crap. I mean, well, it's more than crap, just yeah. sheer brutality um, and completely um, just murderous intent, yeah. I, su- yeah. I suppose. Um, I think, uh, yeah, really absolutely um, top-notch, I think, the way it immersed you in what happened yeah. and the events of um, the, the Tulsa massacre. Yeah. Absolutely. We will obviously be going spoiler filled into our discussion of uh, Lovecraft Country. We would love if you uh, subscribe to the podcast. If you're interested in hearing some of the other stuff that we've talked about, like Watchmen, uh, you can pop on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. Subscribe over there if you want to, or you could just search TV Podcast Industries and on any good or evil podcast catcher and you can pick up all of our podcasts that we've been doing for the last six years uh recently just finished uh the boys season two we did our finale uh of that of that show this week loads and loads of different stuff that we've covered over at our podcast so love if you joined us over there yeah absolutely please uh, in any way you can uh support the podcast uh that is fantastic if you can sharing the love 
is sharing the podcast, mm-hmm. or sharing the podcast is sharing the love. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Or you can pop it over to any any podcast catcher that allows uh, reviews and review the podcast. If you're interested in doing that, it does uh, get some more eyes on the podcast, or ears on the podcast, I suppose, since it's uh, an audio medium. It's that <laughs> kind of like painting with the eyes cut out where the eyes follow you. Didn't that happen in the last episode? In, it, it did, yeah. It, uh, one of the, um, one oh, of sure. the adverts, mm-hmm. yeah, for cream white... Uh, I presume it was flower or something. It was an advert, yeah. um, like and the eyes followed D as she left the alleyway after yeah. being attacked by Captain Lancaster. And you you can see how much has been going on this series. We didn't even mention that. <laughs> so there's still so much that we want to hear from you about. If there's anything that we haven't mentioned, we are totally learning with this show again, like a lot of viewers. Um, so if there's things that we miss out, things that we don't mention, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with your thoughts, anything that we've missed, anything you want to talk about. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, from you on that. Or you can pop over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries we'll let you in there we can chat all about lovecraft country yeah i think with that let us get into our spoiler filled review of episode 9 rewind 1921 derek what are some of the episode details Absolutely, yeah, let's get into it. This episode was directed by Jeffrey Nachmanoff. Um, Jeffrey has done lots of TV, lots of uh, has written lots and has been a producer on lots of shows, uh, but also directed episodes of shows like Homeland, The Brave, The Passage, loads and loads and loads of TV shows. A great work here, though. This is a, a very different uh, type of episode to, to deal with, go, doing uh, time travel back in time to this historical period. So uh, great job, I think, of this episode. And once again, the teleplay was written by Misha Green, Sonia Winton, and Jonathan I. Kidd, uh, all been involved in multiple episodes throughout the show. And again, Misha Green, showrunner of the show as well. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for this episode? Sure. Captain Lancaster's spell has taken hold of Dee, and only the blood of a close relative can save her. With Hippolyta still missing, Tick's father, Montrose, is their only hope. With Dee's life on the line, Montrose reveals his final secret. Luckily, Hippolyta returns and using her new multiverse machine sends Tick, Letty and Montrose back to retrieve the Book of Names from its last known location, Tulsa, 1921. As a massacre of the black population of the city rages around them, Letty convinces Tick's grandmother to give her the book and protect their future. Montrose faces up to his past choices as Atticus learns he played a major role in his father's early life. And some little things coming back from that first episode, that opener of the first episode, where we had Tick having this dream, where we had Tick seeing Cthulhu flying overhead, this big battle going on and raging around him, kind of like the Tulsa battle, but there is obviously his experience in the Korean War is playing into his dream that he had at the time. But... If you remember in that opening episode, he was saved by Jackie Robinson, the baseball player. And in this episode, we have Tick effectively taking on, taking a baseball bat, saving his father. And he refers to him, his father refers to himself as this Jackie Robinson figure came out of the darkness and helped us and saved us. So little ties back to, uh, to yeah, that first dream, absolutely. I suppose. Dreams are never exactly like what happens in real life, but uh, it seems in this show that they may be predicting some things that are happening in the future as well. Yes. So does that mean, Christina, if her autumnal equinox plan goes according to plan, will turn into a massive octopus? Flying Cthulhu, <laughs> maybe. You never know. Could think, be. That you know? could be her eternal life, that she becomes this... Um, this being, I mean, it's interesting the words that she uses here. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been planning my ascension That's meticulously. Right, yeah. Like, it almost does feel godlike. And mm-hmm. if there's an element of that with Cthulhu and the Cthulhu mythos, that he is this all powerful, all seeing, omnipotent yeah. being, and uh, just pretty evil yeah absolutely know? yeah yeah it's really interesting because she does also say that she wants to experience life in a hundred different ways or a thousand different ways uh, whatever way she possibly can effectively not just live forever she wants to experience everything so it's kind of in contrast to all the other people in the society that wouldn't let her join they all wanted to live forever and rule the world kind of thing and she's going i don't want that i want to experience everything and we have we know that she also uses this uh jumping into other bodies to live other lives, almost living the experience of a white man, for example. Um, so this could be a way, but I love the idea that it could all backfire and turns into Cthulhu. <laughs> well, that's it. We've seen foxes' tails come out of people. Uh-huh. We've seen worms and maggots coming out of not only the ground, but also now with uh, with Dee's uh, withered arm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, so, you know, 
what's a few octopus tentacles uh, ripping out of uh, Christina? Yeah, exactly. You never know what's going to happen on the show. And we've only got one episode left to go. But let's talk about this episode, John. Um, where do you want to start for this discussion? Well, I think just to begin with, you know, the point I really want to sort of bring up here is around Letty and the race for the Book of Names. But I think just... Starting from the beginning, you know, the whole impetus of this is to save D. Yeah. Her arm has gone black and withered from the curse that Captain Lancaster put on her. Uh-huh. And Christina is being called in to, to try and reverse the, the curse. And um, it was really interesting. D's arm, it almost looked like Dumbledore from the Harry Potter oh, movies or what it would have turned out like i think we just had his withered hand mm-hmm. uh in in the in the films but yeah. if the um the horcrux spell has continued its work up uh dumbledore's arm uh would look something like uh d's arm yeah but basically here there's a lot of trade-offs that letty christina um and ruby are having to do uh you know hippolyte is still uh not returned mm-hmm. and so they ask christina and i think it's really interesting that with asking christina everything comes out yep. uh all those connections between tick letty ruby montrose and christina uh all come to the fore um and i i thought that was a really nice moment where they're all suddenly realizing that letty has already sold their big bargaining yep. chip or <laughs> traded it with christina Love that, that shocks ask us um montrose having christina there he's like she's just gonna kill everyone we can't trust her ruby does trust her but is doubting that um you you know there's all that wonderful sort of knowing sort of glances between one another and surprises that result in christina uh being brought in to help to cure uh the curse uh that d has yeah absolutely one of my favorite discussions that i that was in there was between ruby and letty and letty's going you can't go with her you can't trust christina and ruby says to her hang on a second are you just protecting your man is that what that what you're doing? Think about what she's done for you. She brought you back to life after her father, not her, shot you. And then she made you invincible. This woman is protecting you. Get in the car with me. <laughs> Love that little moment between them as uh, as Ruby effectively is is revealing that there is this kind of connection between her and Christina, that they're kind of working together. And that seems at odds with what's happening with Tick and Lattie. Like, you know, if you think, I, I love how they kind of framed it because they're telling you as an audience member, think back on this show. It really has been Atticus, George and Montrose who had seen the bad side of what was going on. Um, in terms of Christina, they, they saw everything going on in the family and are blaming Christina almost. And what actually what Christina's done is she, as she says herself, used opportunities, but not specifically used people is what she's saying. Whereas her family, and the whole group around them specifically used George and Montrose and Tick. So I like the framing of that. Let's yeah, say. it was it was really good. And also there is a theory out there that Letty's bloodline may be more important than Atticus's That's true, uh, yeah. in the end. Yeah. So and maybe with the fact that she also had that dream um, around mm-hmm. Hannah escaping from the the lodge in Arden County. Yeah. There's kind of a an interesting genealogical thing going on that we're still not fully clear of, okay. say on Letty's side for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, One final thing before we pop on to the rest of the discussion about this as well. Uh, we didn't notice it last week. We didn't realize what Diana was doing when she was being chased down by characters we now know uh, were called Topsy and Bopsy. Those creepy dancing. Uh, evil, evil girls that were chasing down Diana. And um, what she was doing when she was waiting for them to attack, when she kind of uh, blocked herself into the room, she was drawing comic books of everything that happened to her, all the attacks and everything that was going on. That's what they hand to Christina when she arrives to kind of tell her the story of what happened. So effectively, Diana's speaking from beyond her coma to tell them exactly what happened to them. I love this because if she was saying it in person to them, they'd all be kind of going, oh, you're a bit crazy. None yeah. of that happened. But now that they've seen the after effects of it, uh, they ha- kind of have this um, map of what they need to do or what happened to her so they know what can happen or what they can do to save her. I think that's a really interesting one because we know right from the first episode, our first introduction from D was her 
drawing her comic strips for her father going off on his on his trips so uh so i love that brought that into her character as well but i can't like i can't believe we didn't recognize that's what she was doing last week so great. yeah i i think the other really interesting thing with d um being cursed here um she, she's kind of brought a lot of truth to the table mm-hmm. uh obviously between letty tick montrose ruby <laughs> and christina yeah. but the fact that Christina says she can't re, she can't actually cure this curse because it was done by Captain Lancaster and it has to be him that does it. It's almost reset magic. So she's resetting the clock on the curse is what she looks to do. Uh, but that the curse will then come back to mm-hmm. find her uh, and to track, effectively trace her and track her down yeah. again, yeah. Uh, like, uh, it did in episode eight. Um, so you do have that wonderful exorcism of the, the curse from Christina, mm-hmm. um, with all the, the maggots coming out of the, of her withered arm and seeing one of, uh, the evil twins, Topsy or Bopsy, sort of converting back to D. And, yeah. um, but then, um, because it needs the blood of a closest relative, it ends up that Christina uses Hippolyta's, uh, blood because she returns. Yeah. But, in terms of the truth, it's that Montrose now has to tell his final secret, which yeah. he could have done, well, an episode, two episodes ago mm-hmm. to Tick, um, that Tick is more than likely George's son, not his own. Exactly. And so that does come out here. Yeah. So again, it's not a great kind of moment for their relationship in, in that sense, yeah. but, um, this all really then kicks off the fact that they know that D is going to be uh, chased down. They now know that they must try and retrieve the book of names. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Hippolyta uh, takes them back to the observatory, uh, which is in Kentucky. We were, I think we were saying Kansas actually. Yeah. Um, because the coordinates that were on the orrery. Yeah. And um, when we put them in, it said Kansas, but, um, in this episode, it, it says Kentucky. So there we go. Yeah, um, interesting. We tried. Uh, yeah, we tried. We <laughs> thought we were doing something smart, yeah. but uh, alas, no. Once again, smartness. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's not try and do that. Um, so actually, the observatory is in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see here Hippolyta. I love that she calls herself um, a motherboard. Uh, I thought that was nice. That's um, fantastic. As she hooks herself up in order to get them back to the precise time, mm. and so returns Tick and Letty, and a bit of a reluctant Montrose. It has to be said, and I'm not so. surprised given what we see um, as his life as a younger Montrose yeah. and what he witnesses again, goes through it again as an adult ultimately. Yeah. And so uh, this ultimately comes now to my point right yes <laughs> and breathe out um which is letty's race for uh the book of names mm-hmm. um and i just thought I, I thought this whole episode was really empathetic um you know the, the that kind of bond that you felt between across these generations so letty and tick and montrose ultimately get split up because they realize that they've landed in tulsa on the same day or evening as the massacre happens mm-hmm. and and it ultimately becomes a, a race against time to try and retrieve the book but because montrose takes a, a sideline uh, to try and effectively rescue a, a friend of his um called thomas uh letty is given the task to retrieve the book of names from the the, the two houses there mm-hmm. that we know were burnt down during the tulsa massacre i thought this was just really really good yeah. we, we see letty being chased down by uh, uh a group a, a gang of of white guys uh shooting at her and she makes it into um Tick's grandmother's home yes. and uh and you you see uh Tick's or Montrose's father shooting at the white guys to try and protect her she comes in and there's just this really great just it so quickly develops and it becomes really um quite emotional and and quite horrific where 
the the grandmother recognizes Letty is probably not from um, at least around um, the the town of Tulsa, well, but not even yeah. from this time because of the runners that she has on her feet. But I have the feeling that there's something in the look or something in the performance of of uh, of the grandmother here. So we think this is Hannah's daughter or granddaughter. Hannah's the one that escaped from Ardham Lodge with the book originally. I think this is either the daughter or granddaughter. I just can't get how many great 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 grandchildren are in there. But there's something in the look when she sees the runners that um letty is wearing that it, it seems like she's been expecting something weird like this to happen it yeah. feels like she's been brought up in a household that knows exactly how weird the world is outside of their uh, of their normal home because of hannah experiencing whatever she experienced in Arden lodge and probably the knowledge of the book of of names exactly like the, there's the moment where the the grandmother is convinced by letty that she she needs to give Letty the book mm-hmm. in order for the the family line to uh, continue, yeah. uh, and it, I, I suppose it's that moment where the grandmother realizes that she is going to die, and the acceptance of that. Yeah. And you see how hard it is for Letty, and you just have this really powerful scene where they're holding hands, and of course Letty is invincible, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the grandmother um bursts into flames whilst um whilst she's praying to to god um i and also you know letty explains about the uh, the the child that she's carrying yeah. um and the the grandmother here is really i i love some of the the lines she has um mm-hmm. you know she she accepts that she's going to die and she goes i'm ready I hope the good Lord is. Um, I, I really like that. And, um, you know, in, in trusting Letty, she says, when you have that baby, that is where my faith will be turned flesh with a, a descendant of mine. Yeah. And, and then she burns alive as Letty is holding her hand and watching. I just thought this was really so, so powerful. Yeah. It was a really brutal scene. Uh, as it was filmed, but I love the kind of tenderness of effectively what probably happened in real life or in, in what actually happened before these three arrived back in time. Effectively, she died alone in that room, burning to death, but Letty is able to hold her hand through this most painful possible death that I could imagine, really, um, which I think is it shows the tenderness of, of what's going on, the way they're it's, they're they're showing through the experience of living in Tulsa during that horrible night in 1921. You know, uh, so many people died. I think it's the the number is somewhere between 100 and 300 people because it's been covered up for so long. It's been very difficult to piece together how many people died that night. Nine thousand people of the eleven thousand that lived in that neighborhood had to leave Tulsa because they'd lost their homes. There were ten thousand homes burnt down, and there were orders in place that they couldn't be rebuilt effectively. Um. So 9,000 people left and, and up to 300 people died. So the, That is bonkers, it's isn't it? It's crazy. That, it's really bonkers. Yeah, like there was a lot of research going on at the moment, which is great to hear. There's a documentary being made at the moment. I think after um, the, sh- the light was shone on it a bit more by Watchmen last year, there's been a lot of extra push in the last year coming up to the, the 100th um, year I was going to say anniversary, but I guess memorial of uh, of the massacre is coming up in the next year. And because of that and the push from uh, the kind of, as I say, the light shone on it by Watchmen, uh, there's been a lot of work to go back and look at the uh, the actual tragedy, exactly what happened and try and piece together what happened at the time. But it's, you know, it's 100 years on. I think the last survivor of the Tulsa massacre passed away last year at 105 years old. So it's been very difficult to piece it all together, but there are steps being put in place at the moment to try and uncover the history of what happened in Tulsa fully that night. There's lots of stories, obviously, the kind of things that we see in here, which we'll talk about in a second, but, um, but I love the intimacy of how the death is handled yeah. here and having someone like Letty experience how awful and tragic it must be. You know, and we'll talk about it again a bit later on as well, but Montrose specifically says, in kind of explanation for the fact that George may be Tick's father, he says, well, you weren't there. Anybody who experienced that and went through it had gone through this shared pain that you can't possibly understand. Nobody else could possibly understand. 
And I love that it takes the both of them on this journey to actually understanding what happened on that night as well. So yeah. really well handled. It really was. Um, and you really felt, um, you know, it's that combination of resilience mm -hmm. and the protectiveness of um, the black community, yeah. you know, like how they protected Letty. Um, you, you see how um, they kind of, you know, prepared themselves to defend what was theirs, which is absolutely yeah. uh, quite right. And um, I, I thought this was really amazing. It really felt much more connected with kind of what was happening on the ground. I think with the opening scene of Watchmen, you know, that was a, that was a kickoff effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you see a more sort of panned back, uh, wide cut i suppose or view of what's going on and yeah. um, including those planes that also were brought into uh to bomb yeah. so i mean you kind of think this was this wasn't just some random gangs or militias yeah. if they were able to marshal like what well, a couple of biplanes to drop effectively munitions on the the neighborhood yeah. and so hopefully it's proper domestic terrorism yeah like exactly weapons well you know. it's it really is yeah. and i think they were saying that effectively that the kind of kickoff to what happened was a uh, young black shoe shiner got into a lift that had sorry an elevator that had a white woman in it he apparently stepped on her toe um in there she screamed when it happened somebody else saw that reported it to the police he actually wasn't even arrested until the following day. They thought nothing's going on here. And it translated into this massive, completely misreported incident that led to the uh, the local police arming hundreds and thousands of white members of the community to supposedly protect them from attacks like this that happened. It's it's awful to, to think that this that this happened, but it was apparently quite a regular occurrence at the time in Tulsa, this this group of non-law enforcement who would effectively get together and take the law into their own hands on a regular basis around the time. Tulsa itself, the actual community in the Greenwood... So criminals. Criminals, exactly. Uh, <laughs> as I say, domestic terrorists. Um, the whole Greenwood area had been set up for 15 years as a black-owned, operated area where exactly what should be happening in most communities all of the money that was being generated was being put into local businesses and being put into the local area to build up this community that lasted for 15 years with obviously many issues from uh, from the area. And they took this as an opportunity, this incident, which again, the reports say was simply a white woman getting her toes stood upon, which ignited this massive massacre in the city because there were these people that felt that what was going on wasn't right and took an opportunity and saw this opportunity to to ruin this amazing society almost that had been created well, within it's not within even about right and wrong they yeah. were bigots yeah. racists um psychos basically yeah. that that took a innocuous pretext to effectively destroy Absolutely. Um, and it, it, it it's nuts it's yeah. crazy and um you know, and the thing is, it again, it comes back to the horror that this show is saying about the times, like mm -hmm. that um, black people live in from the fifties and now back in the twenties. And I, I think the complicity of state and federal um, organizations um, to effectively cover it up you know it's the horror of silence yeah. isn't it it's yeah. the silence that is deafening it's the it's like walking into the dark creepy silent room thinking that um people are watching and you and you ultimately go a lot of people knew this ignorance is not an excuse mm -hmm. um or it because there's, there's been a complicity in silence effectively and yeah. and so it that that is just nuts um and so you know we've just mentioned about effectively biplanes being used to bomb the neighborhood and we have um again it's it's a really beautiful framing uh just the way it's done in the show Tick has come back and has gone through the void and, and what we see is Hippolyta is really struggling to keep that rift open. Yeah. Um, Montrose hasn't showed up and neither has, has Letty. Mm -hmm. 
And we, we have this kind of really, um, phenomenally impactful, powerful scene and where Montrose sees Letty walking up the main street in, uh, the black neighborhood here in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. And, um, you have the planes dropping the bombs. Letty is invincible. And you have, um, Montrose recounting, uh, all these different people. Uh, like he talks about, um, one one of the best, if not the finest, um, black surgeon in America yeah. uh, being murdered. Uh, you have all just the, these different the people, brain, yeah. yeah, all yeah. these different people that are um, professionals or own their own businesses mm-hmm. or, or are known throughout uh, by Montrose, um, either directly or by reputation. And you have Letty walking through this destruction of that creation that. Um, the the neighborhood has done in building up this community and so on yeah. with the um the planes dropping the bombs and the music is just builds in a very nice operatic way um with this song L- lovely tone to the lady's um voice mm-hmm. uh, as she talks about sister sister and brother and brother uh, i'd love to know what the the piece is whether it was just done for um lovecraft country i again one of these things fellow dreadfuls that i have searched high and low yep. cannot find it anywhere even use google to try and recognize the song uh, from the screener yep. Uh, Google came back absolutely with nothing. I know. Um, Should be using Shazam. I told you. <laughs> I've not had Shazam on my phone for donkeys since the last um, time we went out to a nightclub, which was probably about ten years. Ago. Yeah, and <laughs> so this crescendo of the violence coupled with the emotiveness of Montrose layered with Letty's defiance because uh, walking down that street to get back mm-hmm. um, was just, for me, amazingly great. I, I um, this it. is one of the kind of best bits of um, of TV I've seen in a long time. Yeah. It, it really raised hers on the back of my neck mm-hmm. um it really did i feel like i wrote the lowest number of notes for this episode because i was Likewise. just watching the screen so much i couldn't tear my eyes away and there's moments in the way that michael k williams is delivering the i suppose the memories it's almost a eulogy of the people he knows that were murdered um in this destruction exactly and that's that is the point these are people that montrose knows the character Montrose lived in this area up until this point. He was, he looks about, about 13 or so, I think, somewhere kind of that age group. So he's lived in this area, knowing these people, seeing these kind of people going about their day every day. He knew the doctor. He knew everybody in his local community or a lot of people in his local community. And he's recounting their deaths, almost like the Holocaust survivors recounting the deaths of, of yeah, yeah. Jews during the, during the war. And it's amazing, again, on home soil. This is America. You know, these are American citizens, and it's happening to them. This happened on home soil in the 1920s. And I love Michael K. Williams' performance here. Yeah. Um, I think it's absolutely beautiful. But I also think there is the defiance in Letty. She knows that she can survive what's going on. But there's also the pure pain that she's going through after yeah. seeing what happened right in front of her eyes. Exactly, with she, Tick's grandmother. Yeah, she's yeah. not running up the street no. to get back. She's also not marching because she knows she's able to survive. She's She is completely downtrodden about this horrible experience and experiencing it, even though she can't die from it, she is experiencing it. She's yeah. right in the middle of it. And I, it, it felt to me with Montrose looking across the scene and with Letty being immersed in in the scene Mm -hmm. of this destruction that there was also an element where they had to commit it to memory yes so we're also watching it again similar to um what uh survivors of the holocaust uh, had to do so that people never forgot and this is something that should never be forgotten absolutely um, and should be an absolute stain on federal and state and probably county government um or whatever until something's done nothing's been ever done about it there's been no reparations paid to the people of tulsa um that survived this uh so yeah until something's done about it should it should absolutely remain top of mind i did see one other reference in it 
though, because I do want to do want to continue and move on through the episode. One of the reference in this, John, <laughs> you might get it. I mentioned last episode. Um, actually, I think after last episode, I mentioned that Letty's first moment of getting the bullets shot at her and her standing up and the bullets bouncing off her really reminded us of one of our favorite shows, Luke Cage, the bulletproof black man yeah. in Harlem. Uh, being able to march against bullets effectively. I remember we talked to the showrunner of that show, Chiro Derry Coker, uh, who was saying that one of the things he wanted to channel through that was the the superpower of a black person in America, unfortunately regularly getting shot at, who would be able to deflect those bullets and be a bulletproof black man in America. It also feels like this is channeling a bit of that here as well with Letty. Having a superpower which would mean you're able to survive the fires of Tulsa feels like the best type of superpower. It feels like they're on the same level with that idea that Chio Coker went in to Luke Cage with. What is the greatest superpower you can have surviving the horrible abuse and horrible attacks that happened to black people in Tulsa or, or surviving the attacks that happened at, at, happen regularly. Um, so I just, I, it, it, I was reminded of that, I suppose, in this scene with Leslie. Yeah, definitely. I um, can see that for sure. Sure. Um, Bulletproof Letitia F. and Lewis. Yes, exactly. So Derek, what is your big point, uh, on, on this? Obviously, that is also my big point as well, that the massacre in Tulsa is a, yeah. is a phenomenally big point, but you know, I, I think we've, talked quite a lot before uh, about um, the experience that Montrose is going through in the series and I love that they're not shying away from his actual experience as well they're using the show to tell this awful experience that many gay people have experienced in their lives Um, not only was this night the worst night in the history of America uh, I would say you know the 1920s America definitely Um, not only was this one of the worst nights for the entire town going through this experience Montrose was going through the formative experience of his life the one that would shape who he was as a person from that point onwards he was going to meet Thomas who was kind of his first love uh, I think is how he, he even describes it but he was going to meet this guy Thomas to tell him I can't love you you're gay I'm not you need to get away from me. We can never see each other again. Yeah. And he was telling him in a very violent way, because you can see from the reactions from Thomas, it's a wordless scene. We hear it being told in this kind of regret, regretful tone from Montrose about what he was doing at the time. He was saying to, he's describing it to Tick as I was telling him that he c- couldn't exist, not even move on and live on without me. He was wishing this whole thing hadn't Got, hadn't existed at all so that he could go on and live the life that his father wanted him to live effectively. Um, we see that he was abused and beaten by his father for, um, for being slightly different effectively. You know, he puts on a corsage in his hair and then gets beaten by a switch in his front garden. You know, um, his father's a massively violent person who's, who's telling him this kind of thing will not happen under my roof effectively. So he is trying to change his life. And follow what his father is telling him is the only way to live. And it leads to him meeting Thomas in the park, telling Thomas that he shouldn't be the person that he is either. And because of that, it leads to them being attacked. Now, there's no way Montrose could have possibly known that inviting Thomas to the park at that particular time to meet him or meeting him there would have led to his death. If they hadn't had that conversation, if they'd gone off somewhere else from the park, would Thomas still be alive and that's the kind of stuff that's playing on on Montrose's mind for the past 30 years effectively since it happened that this kid was he effectively broke up with him in the park and then got a bullet through the through the yeah. head for it um it's such a tough scene to watch and i think because the two of them being so young and being at this early experience and Montrose being beaten by his father for being gay even though his father doesn't expressly say that is what turned him into the person that he was, believing that this couldn't be the way he could live his life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, the writing here and just the the scene creation and all of that, the empathy that you feel for Montrose, you know, Montrose is is not an angel yeah. by any stretch. Um, his dad wasn't. But, you know, you have these two moments where 
Um, I mean, you're first introduced to it with, as the audience with Montrose watching, as you say, his younger self being beaten with the, you know, the birch stick that his, his father's ripped from the tree. Um, and, uh, you know, you have the great moment where, um, their neighbors, uh, Tick's, uh, mother comes to say, to George, why did you not stand up for him? Yeah. You don't seem to be getting this beating. Uh, and you see, uh, like Michael K. Williams is phenomenal in this. Mm-hmm. You, you see the, 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 the pain and, and the, the twitches and the jumps as he is actually, he's not, he is literally reliving the moment by being there and watching from afar. Yeah. What is really good here is that, you know, you've just had the moment where, Tick um has effectively said to um to his father Montrose when we have the book and D is safe we are done uh, as far as him it's over after yep. the revelation about George and all of that and what you have here is Tick as well as Mont you have the reliving of it from Montrose but you have the 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 empathy of of Atticus who sees exactly what his father had to endure as a child yeah. doesn't forgive him for beating Tick but Tick understands that at least for a moment in this but it is when Montrose is the uh, because he wants to go and warn Thomas to to get out of that square because he's going to die yeah. where Tick really really sees this and i think the the empathy uh is a, is really amazing and mm-hmm. um michael k williams again he delivers some amazing lines here where, you know he says he's there to save thomas and tick won't let him save thomas because will it stop him from ever uh, existing will it stop his son then from ever existing that the messing with time and it's the response here from from um montrose where he says no tick it won't as he's just one in a long line of people i sacrificed for you to be my son um which was just yeah that i kind of just wasn't expecting that response but i think that that's where it hits atticus he says over there, I'm telling Thomas he can't be my friend as he's a faggot and I'm not. Yeah. And he's like, all through life, I have told these people that I should have been with and had my life experiences with. Mm-hmm. No, um, to be your father and how proud I was to be your father that that's what I wanted, you yeah. know? Yeah. In, in effect, it, it's... It's the narrow society channels of what you you must be a family with two point four children or whatever it is, or you must go to church, or you must do this, or you must do that. And of course, people create families all over the place, and everyone has their their thing, their skeletons in their cupboard, their the things that they're willing to compromise on, trade off on, mm-hmm. uh, live with, whatever it may be. And, and you, this is what Montrose pours out to to tick here, yeah. and it's just really, really incredible. And yeah, it's, it's one of those. I loved ones, it. Know, I yeah. thought it was great. Yeah, it's one of those ones. Like anybody can tell you their story. Anybody can tell you, you know, I've had these experiences, and this is what I believe, and this is what I went through, and everything like that. But here we do see Tick experiencing firsthand what happened to his father um and i think it's important that he makes that choice to go in and save them he's told by his father that someone came out of came out of the blue and uh with a baseball bat and he's the one that took out the racists around them and saved their lives effectively because of that we know this happened before yeah. this is actual time travel here using the multiverse machine uh, and i think that's the reason why hippolyta is being so ripped apart you're supposed to travel between dimensions and between different parallel worlds and parallel universes effectively but traveling back and forth through time the actual current timeline seems massively more difficult yeah um, and effectively you're not supposed to do it that's why it's taking such a toll i think on hippolyta but tick makes the choice to save his father so when he said he was going to ignore forever after that and i think it's really important it's because he has that experience with him now again i don't want to 
play down the fact that while Montrose is saying, I'm so proud to be your father, he also wasn't a very good father to Tick. We hear that in the description from Tick. You hear him saying, I came here to Uncle George's office to hide out after every beating you gave me, sitting here wishing he was my father, and you're telling me he might be? You know, like he's not a good father at all, but that's partially because he's been pushing down all of these real true feelings and experiences that he had because his father told him to do that. But it's really interesting to see the experiences that he went through. And I think it's really important for Tick to see the life his father did have to leave and move on from in order to sacrifice it for for Tick. And perhaps part of the reason why he did beat Tick is because he resent, resents having to give up all of those things to get there as well. Yeah, and and something maybe that's programmed in. I mean, th- yeah. and that's not to say that that's what it is, that it's programmed into Montrose to beat his kids, but it also could have been. You know, if yeah. that's what he experienced as a child, he doesn't see any difference from doing that as a, as a man. Mm. You know, um, experiences as children have huge resonance across your lifetime yeah. um, and, you know, set you in some respects for the type of person that you may, may be. I think this is just an awesome commentary on personal, societal um, norms, behaviours, um, and the complexities of that, you know, yeah. of dealing with your emotions and how in that moment you respond and it can set a course that is difficult to break from. So this is just so like clever and Absolutely. expertly done. Yep. And I do um, feel it's just really good. Yeah. I do feel sometimes watching the shows, they really have like such a great insight in the things that they're exploring and the things they're showing, you know, going back and visiting Tulsa, obviously a massive moment in black history and American history. Um, but also talking about the real experiences of, LGBTQ people during those times when you couldn't live your life the way you wanted to. It's a really good exploration and they really put it on screen. And, you know, there's, as I say, there's moments I couldn't just, I couldn't tear my eyes off the screen and um, watching some of the things that were pushed here by these wonderful actors and these wonderful uh, writers. Really, really, really good. Uh, but that's the bit I want to talk about uh, in there. Any other, any other things we should be commenting on or other things that we haven't really talked about uh, from the episode, John? Um, well, I do, um, I think we should mention that Captain Lancaster, thank God, isn't oh, yes. coming back. Um, I love the fact that Christina tells Ruby, uh, I have a personal matter that I must mm-hmm. attend to, which made it sound, um, like she needed to go, uh, to the post office or something <laughs> like that. Um, but she is there. And I love the fact that she attends, um, to this personal matter of watching Captain Lancaster die as William uh-huh. um, effectively the the hex that Ruby had placed um, at, on the instruction of Christina in his office had stopped the spell uh, from working I think the Christina says or William says the man with nine lives uh, finally runs out and mm-hmm. um, because you, you there's the two cops who are saying we've done the spell not it's not working yeah as effectively they're replacing Captain Lancaster's body, the, the, the injured or, or, uh, mortal parts of it, they keep replacing it with other body parts so that he can live on. And so I, I wonder how old Captain Lancaster is, but he has the body of a black man here. So they're, they're kidnapping, abducting, uh, black people in order to replace his injured parts, yeah. I suppose. Disgusting. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, like we finally find the explanation of what was going on. I suppose uh, the previous episodes we we'd only seen, I think, a quick kind of flash of uh, of his body below the neck when he took off his shirt at the party uh, before. But effectively, it looks like they are constantly replacing, yeah, as you say, his body uh, from the from the neck down to keep him alive. But um, but that's no longer going to work because of this hex that's been put on him by Ruby. So Ruby saved another life. Yeah. Which is I, kind of cool. I think while we're on um, about Christina, um, we were talking about the confrontation or just like the, all the truth coming out mm-hmm. um, between Tick, uh, Letty, Ruby, Montrose, with Christina helping them uh, to cure D. 
Um, but Ruby confronts Christina after the, the conversation that she'd had with Letty yeah. um, about, you know, are you going to kill Asuka? So, and Christina says, yes, she needs all of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ruby ultimately in this moment is happy to accept that so long as Letty isn't harmed. Yeah. It's effectively the deal or the understanding that she has with Christina in this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not to say maybe she's thinking of ways around it, but at least on the face of it, that's what she says. And the agreement that Tick has made with Christina to help out Dee is that he'll go willingly back to Ardham on the night it's supposed to happen on the autumnal equinox. So, um, So, yeah, is there a way out of this here? We know that Jaya is possibly still in Chicago. Um, we know that she's still trying to save Tick from the prediction of what's going to happen. And uh, and now we know the timeline and there's only a couple of days left, effectively. So, um, so yeah, interesting whether Jaya might be involved, whether Letty might use her new powers to save Tick. You know, um, very interesting to see how this will all play out in the final episode. I'd be shocked if Jaya doesn't come back, though. Yeah, I really hope she comes back. I, I also still wonder whether the ring that, Christina gave to Tick um, the first time they were at Arden Lodge, whether that will come into play again. Was it specific to the ceremony that Samuel Braithwaite was doing there, her dad? Or is it something that interrupts more generally these kind of magic spells? So I'm just wondering if Tick might be able to use that ring that she gave or is this spell just something completely different i know he's kind of been using it as the decoder ring for the last uh, last couple of uh, episodes where he's just been translating the book using it i do think there's also a little bit of a reference here in the trip back to tulsa uh, this period of time this 15 year period where a black community was str- was thriving uh, in in tulsa um i wonder whether that's kind of a connection back to the original I don't know how how, I, how to say this really, but the original description of what the um, acolytes were trying to do with the Book of Adam, they were trying to get back to the Garden of Eden and reset everything back to the good way it was. If that if that's the best if that's the best way to say it, that's that's what Christina Braithwaite's father was uh, saying they were going to do, and what we have here is Tick and Letty and Montrose yeah. going back to almost a a heavenly state, a Garden of Eden for. Uh, for black people in in Tulsa in history it's a place that would be wonderful to have in every city where all of this community is thriving and living well but they're they're going back there to take the one thing that can maybe help them protect the future into the 1950s effectively so I wonder if it's kind of you know a a little bit parallel to what they wanted to do because remember we were talking about it back in episode one and two when we heard the kind of description we were kind of saying what is that he wants to get from going back to Eden and resetting the world to Eden? And it's actually he was looking for men to be back on top, white men to be back in control for the rest of for the rest of time. Yeah, which effectively they are in many in many ways. So anyway, just thought it was a, an interesting little uh, little moment. Uh, last one I want to mention um, is just Hippolyta. Wow, she's powerful now. <laughs> um, she specifically talks about the fact that she's been living for a very long time yeah. in this alternate parallel multiverse Absolutely. Uh, and said that she's had a hundred experiences for a hundred lives and over 200 years and over 200 years yeah so she's had all these experiences i i don't know how we didn't call it out i know we kind of said she remembers that she has d at home and she wants to go to protect him and i know we didn't mention that she obviously didn't come back but um but it's interesting that she did take the opportunity to take all of these experiences until D is in real trouble and then comes back to yeah. save D. I wonder if she saw that as part of what was happening. I wonder if she saw what was happening to D and that made her decide to come back at that very moment, uh, potentially. But at the end of the episode, after doing this transfer of everybody back and forth in time, she's now become the superhero from D's comic book, from from uh, from Orinthia Blue, uh, this character with blue hair. Um, you know, yeah. We saw her adopt the persona when she went into that comic book sci-fi universe but now in the real world she's got this awesome blue yeah exactly so (laughs) really awesome vivid blue yeah um and her eyes were going white as well yes yeah 
had to check that at the end of the episode they had gone back to their normal color so she's not okay. blinded or anything yeah. like that but there is absolutely that moment when the power is just coursing through her it's really cool she looks like storm from uh storm from the x-men when she's floating in the air with all the uh electricity flying off her and her eyes going white i was getting real storm vibes in there so very cool very yeah. cool great um, stuff that's kind of it uh for my thoughts about the episode john anything else that you want to talk no, about no that's everything from me well overall i know We've already said we love the episode. What would you give it a rating? Do you have a rating to give it? I always have a rating. You know that. You do. Um, I would give this five baseball bats out of five. Hell yeah. um, this five is Jackie Robinson swinging baseball yeah, bats at exactly, head. Exactly. Oh, Tick was just um, doing a bit of wish fulfillment there. Yeah. I was, you know, I hate to say this, but I was really enjoying. Uh, how much he was swinging the bat at everybody that was in that uh, gang of a hills. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just think this is fantastic TV. It's social conscience. It's history. It's sci-fi. Mm-hmm. It's magic and fantasy, and it's just awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this. I can't really kind of explain it any further. I, I just thought the the empathy. Um, shown in this uh, writing, in the performances, mm-hmm. um, especially by Michael K. Williams, and also specifically by Journey Smollett um, as Letty, um, with the the death of Tick's grandmother being mm. consumed by the flames, uh, I just thought was fantastic. I mean, all of this to me was really quite powerful and very emotional. Um, and uh, I, even, you know, with Hippolyta, she she's not on screen for very long, but it, it's that determination to save her daughter um, as well in this. Mm-hmm. The tragedy and evil of what happened to the black community in Tulsa on 1921 um, is is really brought vividly back to uh, to life here, Absolutely. and and so it all creates a very very powerful voice i think uh yeah. so i i really really love this and yeah. um, i'm i'm also really hoping that d uh gets well soon yeah absolutely absolutely yeah this was a really emotional episode i uh, found it difficult uh talking about it in the podcast actually but also found it quite difficult to watch uh the episode but i thought it was wonderfully put together really really enjoyed it uh one of my favorites ep- favorite episodes of the season partly because um not only is it a fascinating story i suppose because i really identify with montrose's story and what he's gone through and it's an experience that sadly a lot of gay people have gone through uh over the over the years no matter when it happened really um i really did identify with his story and what was happening with him yeah, but also definitely. the tulsa massacre is brought to life in such a wonderfully visceral and, and really interesting way i thought it was really really well done as an episode and I did forget one thing that I thought was quite funny uh, from the episode. Uh, I, I loved when Christina's talking to Ruby and Ruby says to her, so who's this woman, Dell? So the the other body that she's been using is Hillary. Who's this woman? How did she be getting a coma? And, and Christina goes, oh, yeah, she used to work on my father's summer home. Um, Letty hit her in the head with a spade and knocked her out. So the reason she's in a coma and her body is being used by Ruby is because Letty smacked her in the head with a yeah. spade. I just thought that was it, it just brought it back from uh, what happened to her back in the first episode. Le- Letty has a good old swing on her as well. I she think really does. She could certainly be in baseball leagues herself. <laughs> Let's get on to some feedback from our awesome listeners. Uh, over on email up to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com uh, Parthenia Locklear uh, emailed us about episode 7. Uh, I am and said this episode gave me major Doctor Who vibes. Bouncing around time, alternate realities, but but leaving as a different person because of the lessons learned along the journey. I may need to rewatch this episode. I'm sure I've missed something along the way. I did notice Tick having the Lovecraft Country book in his hand, but it all happened so fast, I thought perhaps I'd missed something. Can't wait to see what the, what his journey was. Interesting, yeah, we learned most of uh, what his journey was back in uh, back in episode eight. Uh, but yeah, definitely some Doctor Who vibes in there. I love that uh, that idea, of, you know, jumping through space and time, always uh, something that we like. But again, we hear it in this episode. It's not a time machine she has. It's a multiverse machine. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Insistent. Hippolyta is about that. It's a multiverse machine that can maybe also do time travel. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Thanks, Pathenia, uh, for that. Yeah, it was so, uh, so good. And... Uh, yeah, actually, I think we ultimately find out that Tick maybe had a less exciting journey yeah. than um, <laughs> than Hippolyta. It was like, grab this book, kick back through Portal. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the impression, actually, in this episode 
that he had seen things. Mm. A little bit. A, little a bit, bit, a little bit more because yeah. he knew about the son. He knew about, um, uh, Letty's pregnancy. And I think that if he'd just been stuck in the white kind of room mm. with the being I am, then that may Beyonce, may... John? Sorry, Beyonce, yeah. <laughs> then I don't think necessarily, unless you just mentioned that I to him. She, I think she gave him the book, said, this is the book by your son. Okay, and Grant. Then... Uh, he kicks it back, kicks it back through the. It hole. just felt, but it, but it has his biography on the back of the book. Yeah, what okay. Learned, and the biography had a bit yeah. more detail. It just about felt it like was. maybe more had happened just with the way it was told um, yeah. in this episode. But yeah, thanks, Bethania. Absolutely, thanks, Bethania. Over on our Facebook group, Donald Dennis says about episode eight, it was a pretty great episode, though I was expecting more from the meeting of Jaya and Letty. Mm. However, the twins were super creepy, and that was amazing. Absolutely, Donald, yeah. Um, I did find out during the week after the episode had come out, um, they did release that the two actresses that played Topsy and Bopsy, the creepy, creepy twins, uh, are both dancers, which makes lots of sense that, that, that they would be dancers because of how they how they moved in the episode. I think we mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. We, we also got that. If, if you weren't freaked out enough by uh, Bopsy and Topsy um, last week uh-huh. uh, on episode eight, we did get a little rerun uh, or re- rewind of um, of their chase of D throughout uh, the last episode, yep. right at the start of episode eight. So yes, yeah. they did come back to creep, uh, creep everyone out for sure. Yeah, mm. really well done. And yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I think we were expecting more of Jaya. I mean, I think with Letty, she kind of reacts to Jaya arriving at the house uh, mm-hmm. and we see a bit of that but for sure it, it felt like maybe did Jaya just simply then head back to to get a boat or a, a plane yeah. uh, back to uh, Korea so mm-hmm. um yeah I have a feeling she's probably still around yeah. in, in some way uh, I hope so anyway yeah. uh, to see her sort of come in uh, for the final episode episode 10 mm-hmm. uh, yeah thanks thanks Donald and um, also on Facebook Angie Arhus, uh said another fabulous episode it put me on quite a roller coaster of emotions from sadness surrounding Emmett Till's funeral mm-hmm. to horror at Dee's plight to relief at Tick being saved by the monster honestly I thought he was a goner in that scene <laughs> And when it ended, I yelled, wait, it's over already? I wanted more. Mm -hmm. Lots of good scares in this one, too. Nobody loves horror more than me. But that scene with the little dancing girls chasing Dee on the train platform might give me nightmares (laughs) for a while. (laughs) Completely agree with you, Angie. That, to me, was such a great horror um as, as yeah. well as them coming down the the alleyway the 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 dark alleyways mm-hmm. as as deers at the entrance uh, watching captain lancaster oh my yeah. goodness yeah this this probably was one of the more horror uh, filled episodes uh, for yeah. sure yeah john's been having cold sweats all week haven't you <laughs> Well, I've certainly not been getting uh, on the train recently. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Or going down any dark alleys at night. <laughs> Smart man. Smart yeah. man. Uh, also, on Facebook, Trevor Green says, The dancing girls gave me my first real scare from the show. I wonder if they got D in the end, or if Captain Lance Lancaster's death broke the curse. Does the appearance of the Shoggoth mean that Tick's spell worked? Yeah, it looks like Tick's spell definitely worked, um, getting the Shoggoth in there. Uh, but yeah, a fantastic moment in the episode. Um, I did like the little touch in this episode that the spell that was cast by Captain Lancaster was attached to him, and he's the only one that could fully remove the curse. I liked that at the beginning of the episode. The only other way to get it was obviously getting the Book of Names is the is the plan, but I, I, I love those explorations of how magic works in this universe, I suppose. Uh, I love that in every movie and TV show where they set up the rules of the magic kind yeah, of thing. Ex- so exactly. this idea that suddenly... Uh, Captain Lancaster had been dispatched by the Shoggoth last episode. And we we were kind of saying it was so quick that it happened. You weren't really sure whether it was him or not. So many people were wearing uniforms. It was difficult to, to find out who was who kind of thing. So I liked that he got an extra death in this episode almost. He got, he got <laughs> yeah. ripped apart last week. He tried to use his his magic to keep himself alive. And we have, yeah, a moment where we actually see him die and breathe his last breath uh, after everything that he's done this season. So I, I liked that they brought that back in. Yes, thanks, uh, Trevor, so much. Mm-hmm. I, and, and to your point around the Shoggoth, I think that is 
or hopefully means that the spell worked for Tick. Although yeah. no sh- Shoggoth appeared in this uh, episode. Um, so I think, uh, I wonder whether it was a one-time spell or whether it was a lifetime achievement ward uh, of getting your own pet Shoggoth to Maybe. protect you. I kind of um, wonder Christina didn't really know what the spell did as well. She kind of went... Oh, and what happened when <laughs> when asked uh, about the attack? I was like, oh, what exactly happened? Tell me all the details, because uh, she's not exactly sure, I think. Or else she is just saying, I'd like to know, you know, I'd like to hear your experience and what happened. Um, thanks so much for that, Trevor. Uh, finally, Angie uh, also had a recommendation for us. She says, not sure if this was mentioned before, but the official podcast mentioned a site in the last episode, uh, langstonleague.com. They have a syllabus that they put together for each episode, uh, except obviously the most recent episode. Uh, have some great information in there as well as reading recommendations. Just thought I'd share, says Angie. Um, I've actually gone on and checked LangstonLeague.com. It's really, really good. Um, they, they've been putting them out on Twitter after each episode airs. Uh, they put together just all of the pieces of historical um information that you may want to know about things that are shown in the episodes there's so many references as we know that even that we're missing even though we're watching these episodes multiple times um but like you know little images of uh that of actual things that were going on in the 50s that have been incorporated into the street shots in in episodes of this show that kind of stuff that put all this detail together in one pack like a syllabus for learning effectively so it's been really fascinating thanks so much Angie I've completely forgotten to mention it on the podcast before that I've been reading it but um it's really really interesting thanks for that yeah thanks so much Angie that's why we love your feedback please keep emailing us to feedback at tv podcast industries our final piece of feedback for the episode is a voicemail in from steve brown once again let's see what he has to say about episode eight seriously that little girl is going to give me nightmares tonight thanks guys but i can't stop watching hey uh john and derek wow uh i just finished the episode and um <laughs> I, I think the the creepy little girls has been overshadowed by the giant monster that just came to save Atticus. So I might be okay to sleep tonight, but we'll see. I'm still not really sure. But hey, um <laughs> wow, a lot a lot happened in this episode. I um <laughs> again, it's one of those episodes. this is a show I anticipate I will be Unlike some of the other shows, I mean, as much as I enjoyed Watchmen, I haven't gone back and rewatched it yet. There's some other shows that I haven't gone back and rewatched. Um, this is one that I think I will go back and rewatch. Uh, once the whole season is done and everything is good, I will probably go back and actually rewatch it in a binge kind of way. Uh, because just to, to tie it all together. But, uh, wow. Um, I love the line and I wrote it, actually wrote it down in my book here. Um, from Montrose, magic is so much more jazz. I just, uh, love that thought that he said that he doesn't mind dying, uh, sacrificing himself for his son because magic is so much more jazz. Um, I love the reveal that the George Freeman who wrote the Lovecraft country from the future that we find out, uh, or a possible future, I guess, um, was Atticus's son, not uncle george so that was kind of cool and uh yeah uh just a lot of good stuff in this episode i can't wait to hear your guys uh you guys break it down and uh, see what you thought of uh creepy girls do you think is uh is d alive is she gonna survive this or did montrose basically uh give those creepy girls the chance to kill her all right talk to you later Thanks so much, Steve. I really am quite glad that that D did survive, actually, Um, because I did think, you know, at the end of last episode, we didn't know what had happened. We saw that final moment as she's being kind of ripped apart by... Uh, by the yeah, two, exactly. two girls by Topsy and Bopsy. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm so glad they have her alive at the end of the episode. Like it's, it's been a dark series with lots and lots of dark things and violent deaths in it, but, uh, I'm glad they didn't take her away. Yeah. I'm really glad, um, that she is still hanging on in there, to mm-hmm. be honest, yeah. uh, because she's still being chased. I have to say this episode, um, episode nine, there was that panned shot of everyone back in the observatory mm-hmm. after they'd come back from Tulsa. 
and I was half expecting to see uh, the two uh, the two twins, Topsy and Bopsy, sort of entering in to the observatory really? <laughs> because they had finally tracked her down. Because right at the start, you've got Hippolyta saying, well, it's four hours to the, mm-hmm. the observatory, another two hours to fix it, and then you going off to then through the rift to get the book of names. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, because it's that notion that they will come chasing after her again, I like that, yeah. and that they'll eventually catch up with her. So I, I half expected to see them, I don't know, coming sort of down the dome or something. I was half mm-hmm. expecting to see that. So I wonder where Topsy and Bopsy are I at this so moment. So many of this show could be spun off into really interesting horror movies uh, that we haven't seen for a while. So uh, that would be very cool. Still don't know what's happening with uh, with how this show is going to pan out for the end of the season. There's one episode left to go and we're, we're kind of intrigued to see if they do what Watchmen did and close it out. They've translated the book into a TV show effectively, put their own spin on it, added some stuff into it uh, to make it an even better storyline. So, um, so I'm intrigued to see if they, if they do the kind of idea where they have an anthology series, they have another horror basis for the second series of the show. And it's uh, a lot of the same cast maybe, or a different cast coming in for the second series. Um, or if they continue the story somehow uh, outside of... Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what they do, mm. definitely. Or, they, as I say, did they just close it down at the end of this season and we don't have I hope any not. season two? I hope not. Yeah. I think there's just been some great writing in the series yeah. and I'm intrigued to see what they would do if they were unleashed on a second series. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so I hope not. But, yeah, yeah. thanks so much, Steve, uh, for As the always. voicemail. Yeah. Uh, really... Uh, really good to get uh, your thoughts and everyone else's thoughts as well that Absolutely. have come in. Uh, really uh, good to hear. Thanks so much. Yeah. And even if you haven't sent any feedback in, thanks so much for joining us and listening to the podcast. We've really enjoyed podcasting about Lovecraft Country uh, this series. We hope you stay subscribed to the podcast. Uh, if you enjoy what you hear, we'd love to have you share the podcast with your friends. Sharing the podcast is sharing the love. And subscribe to the podcast at tvpodcastindustries.com. Ooh, next week we've got one more episode to go, John. Yes, we do. Um, thanks so much for joining us. We, of course, will be here next week back with Lovecraft Country, the season finale, full circle. The full circle going all the way back to maybe that massive dream that, uh, happened in the first episode of the show possibly Maybe it was a vision of the future with uh, the world on fire and being attacked by cthulhu <laughs> and aliens possibly so <laughs> thanks so much for joining us talk to you next time yeah thanks so much fellow dreadfuls for joining us it's a pleasure as always remember keep watching keep listening and keep remembering always remember bye bye, bye.